it seems that different subjects brought you different opportunities. With the still lives, it strikes me that our feet are so firmly planted on the ground when we're looking at them. They're ordered, they're regular, they have an amazing rhythm to them. The San Francisco streetscapes make you feel like the world really is flat and you're looking over the edge of it about to fall off. There's a very different emotional tone, very different kind of risk taking in your compositions. Um, were those things that the subjects brought you or that, that you brought to the subjects? Um, yeah. I started painting the San Francisco pictures by going out on the street and trying to paint directly on site and did that for a time. But it, in talking to uh, Brian O'Doherty, an art critic who knew Edward Hopper, said that most people don't realize how much construction and memory and piece together, his drawings, watercolors, studies, are made into those pictures that we know when we look at. Mm -hmm. And he said, what you can do then is you make drawings on site, get information, and then come back in the studio and play around with them and make compositions, see what you can do from memory. So that's, that's more or less what happened with those. But you then are faced with, let's say, what sort of perspective? Well, if you're gonna try and introduce into it what you described as a kind of vertigo or uh, physical empathy transfer into a kind of discomfort, which San Francisco, I think, can give you, then you've got to use different projective systems so that you can't work a predictable enterprise. You have to use some reverse perspective, some uh, diminishing lines, some three-point perspectives, and try to make it all come together into some sort of a realizable totality so that it's a risk and you're never quite sure they may be overly melodramatic when you do that. It's the risk though is the fun and you, you have to be willing, I think, to fail. And that's my rationalization for some of those terrible pictures. <laughs> How do you know when you failed? Most of the time. <laughs> I don't believe you for a second. <laughs> It's true, unfortunately, but that's okay. I mean, it's uh, the nerve of failure is a very important one. And we all know how trial and error, how many times we've all used trial and error to learn things. So. You schooled yourself so deeply in art history when you got interested in painting and looked and studied and uh, many people will talk, talk about the influences, and you talk about the influences in your work and your um, kind of the, the legacy that you bring to bear in painting from Hopper to Chardin, Rembrandt, Soroya, Sargent, a number of the artists that are frequently mentioned. And it strikes me um, that you have a kind of the, the joy of your work, the color of your work, the boldness of it also bears great similarities with Matisse's enterprise in terms of pleasure, visual pleasure and enjoyment, and yet also the tension that exists between desire and longing. But strangely, I've not run across very many connections that people have made between you and Matisse. Um, oh. any, any thoughts? Is that it, I know you've looked at so many things and so many paintings over the course of your life that raise questions for you, for you too. What's well, interesting, isn't it, about uh, our interests and our loves of when we go to museums, what we like, what we don't like. I must say, I hate Matisse. <laughs> <laughs> and I thought he was so bad and so awkward. And I liked much more Dorothy Hood's fashion illustrations than I did Matisse. Mm -hmm. So I had to grow up, you know. Now he's one of my big favorites. I mean, this is the way and the wonder of going to museums, how you can fall in and out of love uh, from enthusiasms. And 
uh, depending often on your life and what you're doing, what you like and dislike, what you've learned, what you've read, so that that's the marvelous enterprise of having these museums. They're, they're exotic wonderlands of what we are. I mean, who, if you think for a minute about life, what kind of painting style would you be willing to spend your life in? Would it be Impressionism? That's pretty nice. No details. <laughs> no agony. Beautiful colors. You know. I mean, it's, it's a wonder, but how much of that would I want? Would it be cubism? I don't know if I wanted the blocks thrown to everything in the world <laughs> and inner penetrations of everything. It's great as a style, and it's a wonder that we have it. It's part of the anatomy of who we are. We're all part impressionists, all part cubist, all part surreal. And that's the wonder of the museums. It reminds us, hopefully, of what we are, what we want to be, or what we could be, what we should be, might be. How do we get on to this? I don't know. It's Matisse's <laughs> your fault. Good, your good question, was it? <laughs> We're going to take a 60 second, shorter than that, just commercial, because I forgot to remind you all that you have question cards on your seats. And um, uh, Lucy will be collecting them in, in about you know, 10 or 15 minutes. And Wayne will take questions at, uh, at a certain point in our conversation. So I just wanted to remind you that if you have thoughts on your mind or things that you'd like to put forward as a question, please write them out on your card. Um, back to just a formal question <coughs> for a minute. Um, <coughs> Talk to us about your shadows, your shadows that are whole spectrums and rainbows in and of themselves. And I, I find, I think most of us find when we start to really look and let our eyes wander around your paintings, there are amazing things that happen at the edge of ab objects and in the shadows where there are whole miniature microcosms of paintings that exist in those areas. Um, they seem to capture a lot of your attention and effort. Wonderful to wander through a museum again and look just at shadows of things, what painters have done with shadows. It's a wonder, shadow. I mean, it's one of the things that can really save you. Because when you think about, let's say, substance and shadow, or this and its capacity to have a shadow, Think about the light source, or six light sources. Think about point of view, and what can happen to the shadow, so that you can get away with murder with shadows. You can put them any place. It's one of those elements in terms of composition and design which allows you a, a latitude. You can, Lengthen it, you can shorten it, you can move it a little to the right, you can make it dark, you can make it light, you can make it fleeting, you can make it so it almost is ineffable, like a wonderful Morandi painting. You have to kind of really find his shadow. They're, they're on the edge of ineffableness. So that shadows are a, a great saving grace and also a wonderful element that you, that have all these, those two black shadows under the girls. What the hell are those? You know, <laughs> those, if you copied, let's say, what the shadows really were, I don't know what it would be, but it gives you the opportunity to think, shall I have them shorter? Should I have them darker? Should I have them lighter? So anyway, shadows are wonderful. <laughs>